It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lusser of the CBS television news staff and August Hexer, editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Carl Hinshaw, United States representative from California. Representative Hinshaw, yesterday President Eisenhower proposed the creation of an international atomic energy agency as part of the United Nations to which the nations would jointly contribute a portion of their nuclear material. Now, as a ranking member of the Joint Congressional Atomic Energy Commission, how do you think committee, this... Committee, pardon me. Committee. How do you think this proposal will go down with our own Congress? I think it would go down very well. The statements of the various members of the committee who, uh, that I have seen, the comments made by Mr. Durham, for example, and others on the minority side for the time being, certainly, uh, have been very favorable to the president's proposal, and I know that the uh, Republican side of the committee, the majority side, by a small margin, <laughs> uh, is quite favorable to them. So I'm sure that the committee would be very glad to consider and probably would uh, vote out any such proposal. Well, Representative Hinshaw, does this mean that the old Baruch plan is uh, abandoned as too utopian? No, but uh, time has marched on, so to speak, and I believe that uh, some changes might be well be made in the original Baruch plan. So now, you say that Congress will be f favorably inclined toward this plan. Will Congress be called on for action of any kind in implementing it? The Congress has three types of action which it might take. In the first place, uh, let's say that under the original act which I have before me, it provides that uh, if an international arrangement shall be entered into, that that shall su supersede, insofar as its terms go, the Atomic Energy Act itself, and that any conflicts with the provisions of the, of the uh, agreement shall be uh, null and void. And it also says that uh, the Commission, in carrying out its functions, shall give maximum effect to the international arrangement. Now, the international arrangement, by definition, is a treaty or an agreement. And a treaty, of course, is agreed to by two-thirds of the Senate. And an agreement is made by a majority vote in both House and Senate. Well, in other words, were this to go into effect, you don't think that the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 would have to be changed fundamentally? Not necessarily, although it could be. And, you do, and yet you do think that such a treaty would be passed, that the Senate and the House would agree to having, what would they actually have to agree to? To having us give up fissionable material and give up such secrets as now are involved, for example, in the creation of an atomic power plant. Well, I can't foretell what such an, an agreement or arrangement might be. Uh, I can't foretell the action of the Senate in agreeing to a treaty uh, because no treaty is now before it to agree to. Uh, well, Representative Hinshaw, if there has been reluctance to share our atomic secrets with Britain, won't there be even greater reluctance to share our uh, atomic secrets with other countries, especially Russia? Well, I don't think so, not if Russia is willing to agree to do likewise. It may be that they have some information which would be just as valuable to us as our information would to them. Would you be willing to say that uh, apart from military weapons, which have always been secrets in the history of warfare, that the age of secrecy for the splitting the atom itself is past? No, it isn't past because the type of, uh, of uh, information that is uh, proposed to be exchanged or given uh, seems to be in the development of atomic power plants or nuclear power plants, which is a better term. Right. Does this mean, sir, that we have a surplus of uh, uranium or other material of nuclear fission? <laughs> well, I wouldn't like to answer that. I see. Well, in other words, we must have enough to, if we're going to contribute yeah. jointly to a pool. But to go on from there, uh, how far are we, would you say, sir, away actually from the peacetime use of atomic energy? Oh, we're not very far at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I think that we're in the process of building 
an atomic power plant or a nuclear fuel power plant at the present time, as everyone knows. Is that basically different, for example, from the kind of engine there'll be in the atomic submarine? Not basically, no. Well, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, isn't that so, to build a, an atomic power plant or to build a plant that can create nuclear material. Where is all this money going to come from for a United Nations agency, sir? In the United Nations, they could get it from the World Bank for one place. They could uh, certainly find the money uh, from lending agencies all over the world. But what would this mean if, uh, if such a plan were to go into effect to a country, we'll say like India? It would mean a great deal to India, for example, because India is suffering from a shortage of power. And uh, so much work is necessarily done by hand in India, and the people are very poor. If they could make things for each other, let alone the rest of the world, uh, by the use of power, they could greatly multiply their hands. Representative Hinshaw, uh, as I understand it, this is going to be a plan uh, to develop atomic energy for peaceful purposes. It would leave intact, then, all the military developments which now exist. I would understand so. We would have our atomic bombs and Russia would have its atomic bombs. Do you foresee any way in which, as this plan progressed, the pressures toward war would be minimized and these big atomic weapons would... Yes. Be, perhaps... Yes, I do. Because a fissionable material may be used for an explosion or it may be used in a, what you might say, a slow explosion, uh, which is the creation of heat for the manufacture of steam and so forth in turning into electric power eventually. Now, if you are to turn the use of fissionable material away from weapons of war, you can turn all of the fissionable material uh, away from weapons and re uh, rework the material so that it could be used for, f uh, for peaceful purposes and thus abandon fissionable material in the art of war altogether. But wouldn't we be very reluctant to give uh, too much fissionable material away unless we were very sure that Russia was also reducing its military why, weapons? Why, of course. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Yeah. We want to be sure that uh, we were both doing the same thing. Well, the Representative Hinshaw, there's an understandable reluctance about sharing our uh, atomic secrets with Russia, but don't you think that private industry would also be reluctant to share the, its patents for uh, peacetime use of atomic energy with other countries, with private industry of Britain, of France, of Belgium, and other nations which are in competition? Well, of course, Larry, that's a, a very difficult thing to say, except that uh, any of these patents that they now have under the present law are the property of the United States, and the United States would have to share them, not the private industry. But, uh, you know, it's a funny thing, but the British contributed mightily uh, in their science to the original uh, production and use of fissionable material. Perhaps they have developed some information in the meantime that would be of great value to us, and we might like to have it. Uh, I understand that uh, Mr. Brzezinski has virtually turned down the President's proposal in the speech at the UN today. Does that surprise you, uh, Representative? Hinton? Yes, it does, especially... Well, no, I'll tell you, that, that isn't exactly a turn down yet, as I understand it. It's not official from Moscow, as I believe, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, probably foreshadowing mm -hmm. such a turn down. I can't imagine why they would turn the proposal down so quickly. Uh, I, I can't understand it at all, because they, they, have, they run a chance of learning something if they go into it even part way. Isn't it a little bit like the original Marshall Plan, which was to to include Russia in the countries that receive money. They turned that down, and nobody could understand why they did it. Well, this is the same sort of uh, great worldwide offer, and uh, you remember the Czechoslovakia first tried to come in under the Marshall Plan, and then Russia wrapped its knuckles, and they stayed out, and the other countries of Western Europe went in and are on uh, their feet today. Well, of course, I don't understand the Russian ideology, and I believe all such decisions are made according to their ideology and concepts of the rest of the world. And if they're as wrong about the rest of the world as some of their statements indicate, it can easily be seen uh, that uh, such misunderstanding would lead to turning it down. Well, Representative Hinshaw, since I think it's true, and you confirm me if I'm wrong, nuclear material can be turned from peacetime use to, uh, into a bomb very quickly. Wouldn't an agency of the United Nations which possessed uranium and 
or other nuclear material also be in possession of atomic weapons too? They might, but I don't believe it is contemplated under the president's proposal. They would certainly be under in, in possession of a large part of the fissionable material which goes to make up uh, the uh, main body, so to speak, of the nuclear weapon. But couldn't there be, I think in this plan, there could be some provision that it never would be turned to military uses? Oh, an international agency would have to provide so. Uh, yes, well, indeed. Well, what do you suppose, sir, is the next step in this offer that has now been made to the world? To get reaction from uh, the other countries, there has been a, a series of reactions already, or will there be private conversations on uh, what to do about it? Well, I presume that the people who figure those things out are thinking rather deeply, and in the meantime, the nations of the world had better keep their powder dry. I see. Well, Representative Hinshaw, as a final question, I'd like to ask you this. I regard this plan as sincere <coughs> and genuine and humanitarian, but may I ask, What's in it for the United States? Is it in our self-interest? Yes, I believe it is in our self-interest to offer this plan because if it can be accepted by the world, and that includes Russia, then we are bending our efforts toward peace in peaceful, peaceful pursuits. And in that way, we will magnify the good living of the world to such an extent that everyone can enjoy it. Well, thank you very much, Representative Hinshaw. It's very kind of you to come up and inform us on this great subject tonight. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and August Heckscher. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Carl Hinshaw, United States Representative from California. Will there be a Longines watch in your Christmas stocking on Christmas Day? Now, why not a subtle hint to your own personal Santa Claus? Believe me, nothing could give you so much satisfaction and so much pleasure. Now, here in these diminutive Longines ladies' watches is beauty for the adornment of the loveliest wrist and, more important, dependability to keep the busy hostess or busy woman precisely on time. For the man in every field of activity, a Longines watch is a priceless possession. For no other name on a Christmas watch means so much as Longines. For no other watch has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy. Yet, unbelievably, many beautiful Longines watch models are priced as low as 7150, each made to the unique Longines standards of excellence which have gained for Longines the title, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.